Greetings and welcome back to our Standing Watch program. The Catholic Church is being plagued by a scandal which has been described as the worst in decades. And I'm not talking about a scandal involving the clergy, involving alleged pedophiles within the ministry. I'm talking about a scandal which in scope and circumstance and substance may be much wider. I'd like to take you back to articles which were published in May and June of 2012, and I will also then refer to what it may mean in the light of biblical prophecy. The Associated Press wrote on May 28, one of the Vatican's biggest scandals in decades appears to be widening with reports that an Italian cardinal may be involved in a power struggle involving leaked documents, corruption, and intrigue. The Pope's butler, who has been arrested in the scandal, has pledged to cooperate in the probe. The Pope's butler, arrested three days ago for allegedly feeding documents to Italian journalists, clearly did not act alone. Deutsche Welle continued to write this on May 30, 2012. It's a case of intrigue, betrayal, and secret documents that would make a good plot for a thriller. Paolo Gabrieli personal butler to Pope Benedict XVI, was allegedly a mole who passed confidential Vatican information to the press, uncovering alleged corruption, cronyism, and mismanagement at the heart of the Roman Catholic Church. He even passed on details of an alleged murder plot against Benedict himself. The article continues. The Italian media has been rife with conspiracy theories this week, and so has the German media and actually the entire European media. But the only consensus among them is that Gabriele was not working alone. You see, the Washington Post picked up the story, and they had this to say on May 29. Rumors have been flying the press about possible cardinals implicated in the probe. The scandal represents one of the greatest breaches of trust and security for the Holy See, in recent memory, given that a significant number of documents from the Pope's own desk were leaked to an investigative journalist. Few people think Gabriele worked alone. Gabriele is an employee of the Holy See, a citizen and resident of the Vatican City State. He is being held by Vatican police. Now many may not realize that the Vatican State is not only a religious power, it's also a political power. It's a state with its own laws its own legal system, its trials, civil trials, criminal trials, his army in the sense because the Swiss Guard is actually a relict of an army which the Catholic Church has had for centuries. And so they have their own jails as well. This article goes on to say, the scandal broke in January when Italian journalist Gianluigi Nuzzi revealed letters from a former top Vatican administrator who begged the Pope not to transfer him for having exposed alleged corruption that cost the Holy See millions of dollars in higher contract prices. The prelate, Monsignor Carlo Maria Vigano, is now the Vatican's U.S. ambassador. The scandal widened over the following months with documents leaked to Italian journalists that laid bare power struggles inside the Vatican over its efforts to show greater financial transparency. The crisis reached a peak last weekend when Nuzzi published an entire book based on a trove of new documentation. Der Spiegel Online, the very famous German magazine, picked up the story on June 4, 2012, and it has continued to report about the scandal. It started off by saying this, The secret documents expose the pontiff's awkward and helpless leadership in the church. There is no doubt that this flood of paper out of the Vatican is a sign of what the Italian weekly magazine Panorama calls one of the worst crises in the history of the Holy See. Journalist Nazis' revelations open a unique window onto the inner workings of the Vatican and furnish proof of how the game of politics is played in the domain of the Holy Father. They show that like Everywhere else, there are lies, intrigues, and feuds between rival parties. On June 15, the Spiegel Online went a lot further 
and described in a lengthy article what is going on in the Holy See in the Vatican. And I'd like to take a few excerpts from this lengthy article and bring them to your attention. It's something which we should have known. It's something which the world as a whole didn't know, didn't know or didn't realize. This is what the article says. Since the end of May, the Pope's former butler, Paolo Gabriele, has been detained in a 35 square meter cell at the Vatican with a window but no TV. So again, as I said, they have their own prison system. Even with Gabriele's arrest, the leak still hasn't been plugged. More documents were released to the public last week. Fear is running rampant in the Curia where the mood has rarely been this miserable. No one trusts anyone anymore. It all began in the accursed seventh year of the papacy of Benedict XVI. He turned 85 in April. This makes him the oldest pope in 109 years. He is still fit, both mentally and physically, especially compared to his predecessor in his later years. The Vatican is disintegrating into dozens of competing interest groups. Everyone is against everyone. Perhaps Benedict XVI simply knows the Vatican too well to seriously attempt to reform it. The revelations about the secret Vatican documents suggest a Vatican mired in corruption and character assassination campaigns, a plot that seems hardly limited to a butler's alleged act of theft. The Vatican's old guard, made up of Italian cardinals and their backers, believed that they had found a transitional pope in Ratzinger, but now the transition is in its eighth year. The German pope will not be remembered much for his avowed fight to preserve the unity of the church. Instead, he will be remembered as a pontiff plagued by scandals, mistakes, and gaffes. He even built walls back up that seem to have been worn down long ago. He has annoyed the Protestants by declaring that domina dominations other than his own are not true churches. So in other words, he has said, unless you belong to the Catholic Church, you are not a true church, not a true Christian church. He has alienated Muslims with an inept speech in the Bavarian city of Regensburg. And he has insulted Jews by reinserting a prayer for the conversion of the Jews into the Good Friday liturgy. He has snubbed the church by carrying favor with the traditionalists of the Society of St. Pius X, which rejects the Vatican II reforms. The fact that the Pope is German has not had a lasting effect on Germans. When he was newly elected, the German media spoke of a Benedict effect, of now having a German Pope would positively influence conversion and retention rates in Germany. I recall when he was elected, the mass tabloid Bild wrote about our Pope, our German Pope, and they celebrated him like a magical figure. Now that has slowly passed away. This article goes on to say, but if it ever really existed, this effect quickly dissipated. Since Benedict's election in 2005, the number of people leaving the Catholic Church in Germany has more than doubled. Only 30% of Germans are still Catholic today. In deeply Catholic Latin America, the number of Catholics has been sharply declining. Evangelical Christians, on the other hand, are multiplying like the loaves and fishes in Canaan. Benedict has understood better than others what the Church's real condition is and how far removed it is from his ideal. His stumbling block has always been the curia. Perhaps the real thing learned over the last seven years is just how powerless a pope can be. For some time he has been overcome by periods of deep sadness, says a source close to Benedict, though he notes that it is unclear whether this is merely sadness or genuine depression. In the Curia and the back rooms of the Vatican's palaces, efforts are already underway to search for a successor. The possible outcome of a conclave are analyzed and candidates are discussed, as was done seven years ago. The article concludes, Benedict himself knows that he doesn't have much time left. Will the once liberal-minded and now conservative pastor 
finds the strength to foster reconciliation at the end of his life? That's a good question, a question I like to repeat. Because the Bible tells us, my friends, that there is going to be a very powerful Catholic Church at the very end time, which will play a major role politically and religiously in the world. And it will be led by a very powerful Pope. Now, what we have been hearing today seems to suggest that the Catholic Church is declining in influence and that its days of glory are over, but the Bible tells you the opposite. The Bible tells you that something will happen very soon, a revival, if you please. As we see a revival in the political landscape of Europe, where we see Europe being revived one more time, as the Bible said it would be. The Bible told us that Rome would fall, but the Roman Empire would be revived ten times. And we are seeing that last revival, that last resurrection, happening in Europe right now, where you have ten nations, or groups of nations ultimately, coming out of the Eurozone, giving the power and the authority to a very charismatic political leader called the Beast. But this individual will work hand in hand with a very powerful religious leader. And so we see that it's this religious organization of the Catholic Church, which has been in force and effect for many years, which has always been a combination between church and state when the Roman Empire was revived, will be revived one more time. The question is, is it going to be under the present pope, or is it going to be under a successor? That is something we have to watch carefully for, because we know when it happens, times will be short, and the return of Jesus Christ will be very soon. So thanks very much for listening today. This is Norbert Link for the Standing Watch program.